We begin tonight from South Africa, where justice has been served in the murder of Ebuka Okoli in that country last year. A 24-year-old South African police constable, Austin Reynold, has been found guilty for the murder of, in Durban, Kuzulu Natal. 27-year-old Okoli was handcuffed, robbed and shot at close range by Reynold, who was said to be off duty at the time and carrying out an unauthorized raid. Judge Shayam Yenda of the Durban High Court found the accused guilty on all four counts of murder and robbery. Our South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Dibia now reports. For the background, 27-year-old Ebuka Okoli was handcuffed, robbed and shot in the back of the head in January 2018 in this commune where he lived in. The culprits in this illegal raid were one off-duty police constable and a friend who has now turned state witness. At first, there were two accused persons, and then there was one. 24-year-old police constable Austin Luciano Reynold often sat calmly in court, grinding his teeth as counsel battled to prove their case. His charges are one of murder and three of armed robbery. He is accused of killing 27-year-old Ebuka Okoli, shooting him at close range and robbing him as well as those he shared a commune with. The other victims called the city police who apprehended them. Judge Shayam Gayanda listened to the closing arguments of counsel on Thursday and this Friday he gave a guilty verdict on all charges. been keen about this case it has been going on for the past one year and uh, the consulate is keen about it we've been following up and all we want is justice to be done so we are really uh, happy and uh, we, we pray that uh, such will continue to take place if not only this case but subsequent one God, government south african government should also continue to give out this kind of support more especially the independent police investigation directorate they really has assisted us in fact they put a lot of strength to make sure that uh, justice is uh, prevail the accused accomplice turned state witness told us why he ducked no and switched sides somehow you turned state witness i turned state witness because i wanted justice for what happened. Always present in court were the parents of the accused and we asked his mother Caroline Reynold how she feels. She says it's unfortunate her son took the wrong turn from how he was raised. Two doors, you got to choose the right door to open and unfortunately he chose the wrong door. I don't know why he was rebellious, I don't know why he done this and went out to a friend it happened and I just want to apologize to his parents. I am sincerely sorry. Sentencing has been scheduled for Monday the 2nd of December 2019 and the accused is likely to face at least 15 years in jail. From the Durban High Court, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, Betty Dibia, Channels Television News. The convener of a round table on justice for missing persons in the northeast is a legend. About 3,000 families have reported that their husbands and children were picked up by the army during operations in the region. According to Mr. Dayo Aieto, most of those persons have been seen, have not been seen in the last eight years, and he's asking the federal government to release innocent citizens who were arrested for being Boko Haram members without any proof. However, the National Human Rights Commission says that it is working to ensure that families get the answers that they seek. Our correspondent, Makao Kafo, reports. It's a roundtable for justice for missing persons, but not just any missing person, but persons who have disappeared as a result of the military operations in the Northeast. Some concerned women are also at this meeting seeking for answers for the whereabouts of their loved ones, especially husbands and children. Hajiya Yakuraba Bagana says her son has been missing for the past eight years and she has heard nothing about him since then. An activist, Hamsatu Al-Amin, 
who runs a non-governmental organization for missing persons in the Northeast, corroborates Hajia Babagana's story. It's eight years now, since 2011, September. I don't know where he is. So after this, I didn't see him again. Up to now, I don't know where he is. I don't know whether he's alive or not. You cannot impact nowhere to go and then start asking for. That's why these poor women, when they dare go to the military facilities, sometimes some bad eggs among the uh, soldiers will ask them for money. They will sell their houses, they will sell their jewelries and all resources to go and hand over to them. But even then, there are no more to be found. So it is now, some of them is up to five years, eight years now. There is no accountability, no news about them, nobody is saying anything. Efforts to get the military to respond to the allegation proved abortive. However, the National Human Rights Commission admits that it has received such complaints and is working to get to the root of the matter. The Commission and its monitors, especially in the three um, insurgency states of Borno, Adamawa and Yobe, have concluded plans to visit all uh, military detention facilities, to visit all prisons, to visit all police stations, with a view to um, finding out whether there are um, displaced persons there, whether there are missing persons there. And um, in this effort, we'll be able to um, unravel some of the um, uh, information about missing persons. These women will return to their base, hoping that their voice has been heard. Amaka Okafu, Channels Television News. Meanwhile, the wife of the president, Mrs. Aisha Buhari, is challenging all government officials to be conscious of the cost of injustice on Nigeria's development, while also throwing her weight behind social media regulation. She made the observation at the opening of the National Executive Council meeting of the Nigerian Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs. Also, at the occasion, while delivering the keynote address, Vice President Yemi Oshibajo says that it is crucial that a nexus is created between the noble teaching of religion and the daily activities of Nigerians. Our correspondent Kayla Megwa now reports. But the former the Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs is the apex body established to cater for and promote the interests of Muslims in Nigeria. It's headed by the Sultan of Sokoto, Muhammad Saad Abubakar, who at this General Assembly and National Executive Council meeting urges Muslims to protect Nigeria from forces determined to tear the country apart. Mr. President lamented that the social problems in Nigeria are too many, that if we don't take time, they will bring Nigeria down. And it's true. And social problems are too many. Not talk of economic problems. So we have to have a family. And a family is the starting point of all good things or bad things in any community, in any humanity. Mrs. Aisha Buhari charges government officials to ensure justice is always served. She also throws her weight behind the need for social media regulation. If China can control 1.8 billion people on social media, I've seen no reason why Nigeria should not attempt, attempt, attempt controlling only 180 million people. Most of us here, as a result of the long term of injustice done to others, today most of us cannot go to our villages and sleep with, with our two eyes closed. We all know that. We should either First in our seatbelt, get up and do the needful, or we will all regret it very soon. Declaring the assembly open, Vice President Professor Yemi Oshimbajo speaks on the sacrifices leaders need to make for nations to be built. No true leader can ignore the threat that religious bigotry and intolerance poses for the development of our nation. That is just the way it is. But it is my respectful view that the burden of ensuring that faith promotes national development as opposed to impeding it is on leaders. The burden is on leaders. This is the challenge that I pose to you today. Over 90% of Nigerians are religious, whether Christian or Muslim. 
the challenge has always been the ability to translate these noble tenets of both religions, such as justice, fairness, equity, love and peace, translating these things into everyday life. Mr. Vice President says that is the nexus between religion and national development. The Supreme Council for Islamic Affairs for Nigeria say in this conference, they are poised to ensure that that nexus exists. Kayla Megwa, Channel Television News. The federal government will soon commence the construction of the 600-kilometer Ajakuta Kaduna Canal gas pipeline, which will move gas from the southern part of the country to the north. President Muhammad Buhari offered this assurance while addressing the fifth gas export countries forum in Malabo, Equatorial Guinea. He adds that the viability of extending the gas pipeline to North Africa is also under consideration. A statement from the presidential spokesman quotes President Buhari, We are mindful of the energy deficit in the developing world, especially here in Africa, where we have nearly 600 million people without access to modern energy. As responsible leaders, it is our duty to preserve the environment, not only for the present, but for future generations. The president notes that the one-day meeting is taking place at a crucial time when global energy supply is transitioning from hydrocarbons to renewable energy. The president has since returned to the country and is currently in his hometown, Dora on a five-day official visit to Katsina State. In the meantime, the federal government says that it is increasing its counterpart funding for the control of HIV and AIDS in the country to $12 million, and this is captured in the 2020 national budget. The Minister of Health announced this at a news conference to mark the 2019 World AIDS Day in Abuja. The theme for this year's World AIDS Day is Communities make the difference, and it focuses on mobilizing communal support in raising great awareness on the need for testing and treatment. The two ministers of health arrived at the venue of the 2019 World AIDS Day media conference in Abuja. Honorable Minister of Health, Dr. Osage Ihanere. Apart from using the occasion to raise awareness for the control of HIV and AIDS, the Minister of Health, as well as other representatives of agencies of government, give account of their stewardship on the control of the virus in Nigeria. The contribution Nigeria is to make was $10 million. And this year, we made a pledge of $12 million, of which, over the next three years, of which uh, we have included part in the budget to be paid, so that we are up to date and on track to, to uh, to meet our pledge. Over the last 15 years, over $4 billion have been invested in HIV prevention and treatment in Nigeria. And what the result is, is the epidemic is shrinking. Globally, there is an estimated 37.9 million people living with HIV and AIDS. 62% of that population are on treatment, as about 53% have already achieved viral suppression. In Nigeria, an estimated 1.9 million people are living with HIV and AIDS. 55% of the adult population with the virus are on treatment. This is in addition to another 35% representing children living with the virus that are also receiving treatment. Development partners say more still need to be done if Nigeria is to achieve the 1990-90 target, which hopes to achieve 90% of citizens testing to know their HIV status 90% treatment and 90% viral suppression by the year 2020. For Nigeria to achieve the 1990-90 target, we need to find and place at least 500,000 more people on treatment. We need to improve treatment outcome and close the tap on new infections. I want to call on government to also do as much as possible to increase uh, demand creation for testing. We need to do more in terms of testing people. For over a decade, it appears that Nigeria may never win the fight against the spread of HIV and AIDS. But with a renewed campaign, mobilizing the support of community influencers, the federal government is hopeful that more people will come out for testing and treatment and eventually suppress the HIV viral load by the year 2020.